tonight. Oh, I'm dedicating this hearing and chanting session to my dear God brother Rajendra Nandana Prabhu. I just spoke to whom I just spoke to. He's um, found out he has cancer and uh, is entered into hospice. So he, he doesn't have long to stay in the world. He's, I talked to him today. He was in very good spirits, saying how grateful he is to have had this opportunity to serve Srila Prabhupada in this life. And it was a very touching conversation, so I'll be thinking about him tonight as his only real business in life is hearing and chanting. A couple of years ago when we got to Mayapur, he told me, I just want to hear, <laughs> nothing else. So this is for you, Raj. Hare Krishna. Jaya Radha Madhava Jaya Kunda Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Jaya Kunja Bihari Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 
shelter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, we can cross over the dangerous ocean of material birth and death. So that's what we're going to do. I first offer my respectful obeisances to His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, who introduced the Srimad Bhagavatam to the entire world and uh, left it behind so that we'd be doing this very thing now, sitting together. He said any kind of questions can be resolved, answered by sitting together and discussing Srimad Bhagavatam. So we're taking up at the second canto, second chapter, verse number 17. And this chapter is entitled, The Lord in the Heart. In that transcendental state of labdo pashanti, there is no supremacy of devastating time which controls even the celestial demigods who are empowered to rule over mundane creatures and what to speak of the demigods themselves. Nor is there the mode of material goodness, nor passion, nor ignorance, nor even the false ego, nor the material causal ocean, nor the material nature. Purport, devastating time, which controls even the celestial demigods by its manifestations of past, pe present, and future, does not act on the transcendental plane. The influence of time is exhibited by the symptoms of birth, death, old age, and disease, and these four principles of material conditions are present everywhere, in any part of the material cosmos up to the planet Brahmaloka, where the duration of life of the inhabitants appears to us to be fabulous. Insurmountable time even brings about the death of Brahma, so what to speak of other demigods like Indra, Chandra, Surya, Vayu, and Varuna. The astronomical influence directed by the different demigods over mundane creatures is also conspicuous by its absence. In material nature, the living entities are afraid of satanic influence. But for a devotee on the transcendental plane, there is no such fear at all. The living entities change their material bodies in different shapes and forms under the influence of the different modes of material nature. But in the transcendental state, the devotee is gunatita, or beyond the material modes of goodness, passion, and ignorance. Thus, the false ego of I am the Lord of all I survey does not arise there. In the material world, the false ego of the living being trying to lord it over the material nature is something like the moths falling in a blazing fire. The moth is captivated by the glaring beauty of the fire, and when he comes to enjoy it, the blazing fire consumes him. In the transcendental state, the living being is pure in his consciousness. And as such, he has no false ego to lord it over the material nature, moth into the flame. Rather, his pure consciousness directs him to surrender unto the Supreme Lord, 
as stated in the Bhagavad Gita, Vasudeva Sarvamiti Sa Mahatma Sudulabha. All this indicates that in the transcendental state there is neither material creation nor the causal ocean for material nature. The above mentioned state of affairs is factual on the transcendental plane, but is factually revealed in a transcendentalist's knowledge of the advanced state of pure consciousness. Such transcendentalists are of two types, namely the impersonalists and the devotees. For the impersonalists, the ultimate goal or destination is the Brahma Jyoti of the spiritual sky. But for the devotees, the ultimate goal is the Vaikuntha planets. The devotees experience the above mentioned state of affairs by attainment of spiritual forms for activity in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. But the impersonalist, because of his neglecting the association of the Lord, does not develop a spiritual body for spiritual activity, but remains a spiritual spark only, merged in the effulgent spiritual rays of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Lord is the full-fledged form of eternity, bliss, and knowledge. But the formless Brahma Jyoti is simply eternity and knowledge. The Vaikuntha planets are also forms of eternity, bliss, and knowledge. And therefore, the devotees of the Lord who are admitted into the abode of the Lord also get bodies of eternity, bliss, and knowledge. As such, there is no difference between one and another. The Lord's abode, name, fame, entourage, etc. are of the same transcendental quality. And how this transcendental quality differs from the material world is explained herewith in this verse. In the Bhagavad Gita, Three principal subjects have been explained by Lord Sri Krishna, namely Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, and Bhakti Yoga. But one can reach the Vaikuntha planets by the practice of Bhakti Yoga only. The other two are incompetent in helping one to reach the Vaikuntha Lokas, although they can, however, conveniently take one to the effulgent Brahma Jyoti as described above. The transcendentalists desire to avoid everything godless, for they know that the supreme situation in which everything is related with the Supreme Lord Vishnu. The transcendentalists desire to avoid everything godless, for they know that supreme situation in which everything is related with the Supreme Lord Vishnu. Therefore, a pure devotee who is in absolute harmony with the Lord does not create perplexities but worships the lotus feet of the Lord at every moment, taking them into his heart. Everyone ready for the purport? Okay. In the Bhagavad Gita, Madhama, my abode, is mentioned several times. And according to the version of the Supreme Personality of God, Sri Krishna, there exists the unlimited spiritual sky wherein the planets are called Vaikuntas, or the abode of the Personality of Godhead. In that sky which is far, far beyond the material sky and its sevenfold coverings, there is no need of the sun or the moon, nor is there necessity of electricity for illumination, because the planets are self-illuminating and more brilliant than the material suns. Pure devotees of the Lord are absolutely in harmony with the Personality of Godhead, or in other words, they always think of the Lord as their only dependable friend and well-wisher. They do not care for any mundane creature up to the status of Brahma, the Lord of the universe. Only they can definitely have a clear vision of the Vaikuntha planets. Such pure devotees being perfectly directed by the Supreme Lord do not create any artificial perplexity in the matter of transcendental understanding by wasting time in discussing what is Brahman and what is non-Brahman or Maya nor do they falsely think of themselves as one with the Lord or argue that there is no existence of the Lord separately or that there is no God at all or that living beings are themselves God or that when God incarnates himself, he assumes a material body. Nor do they concern themselves with many obscure speculative theories which are in actuality so many stumbling blocks on the path of transcendental understanding. Apart from the class of impersonalists or non-devotees, there are also classes who pose themselves as devotees of the Lord, but at heart maintain the idea of salvation, 
by becoming one with the impersonal Brahman. They wrongly, wrongly manufacture their own way of devotional service by open debauchery and mislead others who are simpletons or debauchees like themselves. All these non-devotees and debauchees, you can look the word debauchee up, debauchees are, according to Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur, duratmas or crooked souls in the dress of mahatmas or great souls. Such non-devotees and debauchees are completely excluded from the list of transcendentalists by the presentation of this particular verse by Shukadev Goswami. So the Vaikuntha planets are factually the supreme residential places called the Parampadam. The impersonal Brahma Jyoti is also called the Parampadam due to its being the rays of the Vaikuntha planets as the sun rays are the rays of the sun. In the Bhagavad Gita 1427, it is clearly said that the impersonal Brahma Jyoti rests on the person of the Lord, and because everything rests on the Brahma Jyoti directly and indirectly, everything is generated from the Lord. Everything rests on Him, and after annihilation, everything is merged in Him only. Therefore, nothing is independent of Him. A pure dev devotee of the Lord no longer wastes valuable time in discriminating discriminating the Brahman from non-Brahman because he knows perfectly well that the well that the Lord Parabrahman by his Brahman energy is interwoven in everything and thus everything is looked upon by a devotee as the property of the Lord interwoven is a nice verse nice word Otam Protam the devotee tries to engage everything in his service and does not create perplexities by falsely lording it over the creation of the Lord. He is so faithful that he engages himself as well as everything else in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. In everything, the devotee sees the Lord and he sees everything in the Lord. The specific disturbance created by a duratma or crooked soul is due to his maintaining that the transcendental form of the Lord is something material. Debauchi. Otam protam is a phrase used a couple places in the Bhagavatam. It refers to the threads on a loom. One goes horizontally and the other one goes vertically and they keep throwing the, the um, there's a technical name for it. Does anybody know? None of you weave cloth at home. You throw the and put it through and so you get this uh, tight weave horizontal verticals. So that's the otam and protam. So otam protam chasamstitam the Lord is situated as otam protam is within everything interwoven into every aspect of the creation. Pray tell, what does debauchy mean? Debauchy, noun, a person given to excessive indulgence in sensual pleasure, pleasures. Mid-17th century from French, debauchy turned away from duty. Turned away from duty. Wow. There you have it. Debauchy. From French. Okay. Keep going. Yes. Text 19. By the strength of scientific knowledge, one should be well situated in absolute realization and thus be able to extinguish all material desires. One should then give up the material body by blocking the air hole through which stool is evacuated with the heel of one's foot and by lifting the air, life air, from one place to another in the six primary places. Purport. There are many Duratmas who claim to have realized themselves in Brahman and yet are unable to conquer material desires. In the Bhagavad Gita 1854, it is clearly explained that an absolutely self-realized soul becomes completely aloof from all material desires. Material desires are based on the false ego of the living being and are exhibited by his childish and useless activities to conquer the laws of material nature and by his desire to lord it over the resources of the five elements. 
With such a mentality, one is led to believe in the strength. With such a mentality, one is led to believe in the strength of material science with its discovery of atomic energy and space travel by mechanical vehicles, and by such tiny advancements in material science, the false egoist tries to challenge even the strength of the Supreme Lord, who can finish all man's tiny endeavors in less than a second. The well-situated self, or Brahman-realized soul, perfectly understands that the Supreme Brahman, or the personality of Godhead, is the all-powerful Vasudev, and that he, the self-realized living being, is part and parcel of the supreme whole. The well-situated self. As such, his constitutional position is to cooperate with him in all respects, in the transcendental relation of the served and the servitor. <clears throat> such a self-realized soul ceases to exhibit his useless activities of attempting to lord it over material nature. Being scientifically well informed, he fully engages himself in faithful devotion to the Lord. The expert yogi who has thoroughly practiced the control of the life air by the prescribed method of the yoga system is advised to quit the body as follows. He should plug up the evacuating hole with the heel of, his, of the foot and then progressively move the life air on and on to six places, the navel, abdomen, heart, chest, palate, eyebrows, and cerebral pit. Controlling the life air by the prescribed yogic process is mechanical, and the practice is more or less a physical endeavor for spiritual perfection. Is that a class offered at UC Davis, or how to move the life air up? In olden days, such practice was very common for the transcendentalists, for the mode of life and character in those days were favorable. But in modern days, when the influence of Kali Yuga is so, disturbance, so disturbing, practically everyone is untrained in this art of bodily exercise. Concentration of the mind is more easily attained in these days by the chanting of the holy name of the Lord. The results are more effective than those derived from the inner exercise of the life air. 20. The meditative devotee should slowly push up the life air from the navel to the heart, from there to the chest, and from there to the root of the palate. He should search out the proper places with intelligence. There are six circles of the movement of the life air, and the intelligent bhakti yogi should search out these places with intelligence and in a meditative mood. Among these mentioned, among these mentioned, uh, among these mentioned above is the Swatishtana Chakra, or the powerhouse of the life air. And above this, just below the abdomen and navel, is the Mani Puraka Chakra. When the upper space is further re searched out in the heart, one reaches the Anahata Chakra, and further up. When the life air is placed at the root of the palate, one reaches the Vishuddhi Chakra. It's the powerhouse of the life air. That's the Swatishtana Chakra. 21. Thereafter, the Bhakti Yogi should push the life air up between the eyebrows and then blocking the seven outlets of the life air, he should maintain his aim for going back home, back to Godhead. If he is completely free from all desires for material enjoyment, he should then reach the cerebral hole and give up his material connections, having gone to the Supreme. Purport. The process of giving up all material connections and returning home back to Godhead, the Supreme, is, is recommended herein. The condition is that one should be completely freed from desire for material enjoyment. There are different grades of material enjoyments in respect to duration of life and sensual gratification. The highest plane of sensual enjoyment for the longest period of life is mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita 920. All are but material enjoyments, and one should be thoroughly convinced that he has no need of such a long duration of life, even in the Brahmaloka planet. 
He must return home back to Godhead and must not be attracted by any amount of material facilities. In the Bhagavad Gita 2.59, it is said that this sort of material detachment is possible to attain when one is acquainted with the supreme association of life. Param drishva nivartate. One cannot be freed from material attraction unless he has complete understanding of the nature of spiritual life. The propaganda by a certain class of impersonalists that spiritual life is void of all varieties is dangerous propaganda to mislead the living beings into becoming more and more attracted by material, en material enjoyments. As such, persons with a poor fund of knowledge cannot have any conception of the param, the supreme. They try to stick to the varieties of material enjoyments, although they may flatter themselves as being Brahman-realized souls. Such less intelligent persons cannot have any conception of the param, as mentioned in this verse, and therefore they cannot reach the supreme. The devotees have full knowledge of the spiritual world, the personality of Godhead, and his transcendental association in unlimited spiritual planets called Vaikuntha Lokas. Herein, Akunta Drishti is mentioned. Akunta and Vaikuntha convey the same import. And only one who is, has his aim fixed upon that spiritual world and personal association with the Godhead can give up his material connections even while living in the material world. This param and the param dhamma mentioned in several places in the Bhagavad Gita are one and the same thing. One who goes to the param dhamma does not return to the material world. This freedom is not possible even by reaching the topmost loka of the material world. The life air passes through seven openings, namely two eyes, two nostrils, two ears, and one mouth. Generally, it passes through the mouth at the time of an ordinary, ordinary man's death. But the yogi, as above mentioned, who controls the life air in his own way, generally releases the life air by puncturing the cerebral hole in the head. The yogi, therefore, blocks up all the above mentioned seven openings so that the life air will naturally burst forth through the cerebral hole. This is the sure sign of a great devotee's leaving the material connection. However, O King, if a yogi maintains a desire for improved material enjoyments, like transference to the topmost planet, Brahma Loka, or the achievement of the Eightfold Perfections, travel in outer space with the Vayayasas, or a situation in the millions, in one of the millions of planets, then he has to, to take away with him the materially molded mind and senses. In the upper status of the planetary systems, there are facilities thousands and thousands of times greater for material enjoyments than in the lower planetary systems. The topmost planetary systems consist of planets like Brahmaloka and Dhruvaloka, the pole star, and all of them are situated beyond Maharlok. The inhabitants of those planets are empowered with eightfold achievements of mystic perfection. They do not have to learn and practice the mystic processes of yoga, perfection, and achieve the power of becoming small like a particle, anima siddhi, or lighter than a soft feather, lagima siddhi. They do not have to get anything and everything from anywhere and everywhere, prapti siddhi, to become heavier than the heaviest, mahima siddhi, to act freely even to create something wonderful or to annihilate anything at will, ishitva siddhi, to control all material elements, vashitva siddhi, to pose such power as will never be frustrated in any desire, prakamya siddhi, or to assume any shape or form one may even whimsically desire, kamav Vasayita Siddhi. All these expediencies are as common as natural gifts for the inhabitants of those higher planets. They do not require any mechanical help to travel in outer space, and they can move and travel at will from one planet to any other planet within no time. The inhabitants of the earth cannot move 
even to the nearest planet except by mechanical vehicles like spacecraft. But the highly talented inhabitants of such higher planets can do everything very easily. Such a materialist is generally inquisitive to experience what is actually in such planetary systems. He wants to see everything personally. As inquisitive persons tour all over the world to gain direct local experience, the less intelligent transcendentalist similarly desires to have some higher, to have some experience of those planets about which he has heard so many wonderful things. The yogi can, however, easily fulfill his desire by going there with the present materialistic mind and senses. The prime inclination of the materialistic mind is to lord it over the material world. And all the cities mentioned above are features of domination over the world. The devotees of a lord are not ambitious to dominate a false and temporary phenomenon. On the contrary, a devotee wants to be dominated by the superior predominator, the Lord. A desire to serve the Lord, the supreme predominator, is spiritual or transcendental, and one has to attain this purification of the mind and the senses to get admission into the spiritual kingdom. With the materialistic mind, one can reach the best planet in the universe, but no one can enter into the kingdom of God. Senses are called spiritually purified when they are not involved in sense gratification. Senses require engagements. And when the senses are engaged totally in the transcendental loving service of the Lord, they have no chance to become contaminated by material infections. The, trans the transcendentalists are concerned with the spiritual body. As, as such, by the strength of their devotional service, austerities, mystic power, and transcendental knowledge, their movements are unrestricted within and beyond the material worlds. The fruit of workers or the gross materialists can never move in such an unrestricted manner. Purport, the materialistic scientists' endeavor to reach other planets by mechanical vehicles is only a futile attempt. One can, however, reach heavenly planets by virtuous activities, but one can never expect to go beyond Swarga or Janaloka by such mechanical or materialistic activities, either gross or subtle. The transcendentalists who have nothing to do with the gross material body can move anywhere within or beyond the material worlds. Within the material worlds, they move in the planetary systems of the Mahar, Janas, Tapas, and Satyaloka. And beyond the material worlds, they can move in the Vaikunthas as unrestricted spacemen. Narada Muni is one of the examples of such spacemen, and Durvasa Muni is one of such mystics. By the strength of devotional service, austerities, mystic powers, and transcendental knowledge, everyone can move like Narada, movie, Narada Muni or Durvasa Muni. It is said that Durvasa Muni traveled throughout the entirety of material space and part of spiritual space within one year only. The speed of the transcendentalists can never be attained by the gross or subtle materialists. O King, when such a mystic passes over the Milky Way by the illuminating Shushumna, to reach the higher, uh, O King, when such a mystic passes over the Milky Way by the illuminating Sushumna to reach the highest planet, Brahmalok, he first goes to Vaishvanara, the planet of the de deity of fire, wherein he becomes completely cleansed of all contaminations. And thereafter, he still goes higher to the circle of Shushumar to relate with Lord Hari, the personality of Godhead. To relate with whom? Lord Hari. The, poles, the polar star of the universe and the circle thereof is called Shishumar Circle. And therein the local residential planet of the personality of Godhead, Shiradakshai Vishnu, is situated. Before reaching there, the mystic passes over the Milky Way to reach Brahmaloka. And while going there, he first reaches Vaishvanara Loka, where the demigod controls fire. On Vaishvanara Loka, the yogi becomes completely cleansed of all dirty sins acquired while in contact with the material world. 
The Milky Way in the sky is indicated herein as the way leading to Brahmaloka, the highest planet of the universe. This Shishumar is the pivot for the turning of the complete universe, and it is called the navel of Vishnu, Garbhadakshayi Vishnu. The yogi alone goes beyond this circle of Shishumar and attains the planet Maharloka, where purified saints like Bhrigu enjoy a duration of life of 4 trillion 300 million solar years. Oh, sorry. 4 billion 300 million solar years. This planet, I'm thinking of the uh, federal deficit. <laughs> this planet is worshipable even for the saints who are transcendentally situated. At the time of the final devastation of the complete universe, the end of the duration of Brahma's life, a flame of fire emanates from the mouth of Ananta, from the bottom of the universe. The yogi sees all the planets of the universe burning to ashes, and thus he leaves for Satyaloka by airplanes used by the great purified souls. The duration of life in Satyaloka is calculated to be 15 trillion 480 billion years only. It is indicated herein that the residence of Maharloka, where the purified living entities or demigods possess a duration of life calculated to be 4 billion 300 million years, solar years, have airships by which they reach Satyaloka, the topmost planet of the universe. In other words, the Srimad Bhagavatam gives us many clues about other planets far, far away from us, which modern planes and spacecraft cannot reach, even by imaginary speeds. The statements of Srimad Bhagavatam are accepted by great acharyas like Sridhar Swami, Ramanujacharya, and Balava Acharya. Lord Sri, Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu specifically accepts Srimad Bhagavatam as the spotless Vedic authority. And as such, no sane man can ignore the statements of Srimad Bhagavatam when it is spoken by the self-realized soul, Srila, Srila Shukadeva Goswami, who follows in the footsteps of his great father, Srila Vyasadeva, the compiler of all Vedic literatures. In the creation of the, of the Lord, there are many wonderful things which we can see with our own eyes every day and night, but we are unable to reach them equipped by modern materialistic science. We should not, therefore, depend on the fragmentary authority of materialistic science for knowing things beyond the range of scientific purview. For a common man, both modern science and Vedic wisdom are simply to be accepted because none of the statements, either of modern science or of Vedic literature, can be verified by him. The alternative for a common man is to believe either of them or both of them. The Vedic way of understanding, however, is more authentic because it has been accepted by the Acharyas, who are not only faithful and learned men, but are also liberated souls without any of the flaws of conditioned souls. The modern scientists, however, are conditioned souls liable to so many errors and mistakes. Therefore, the safe side is to accept the authentic version of Vedic literatures like Srimad Bhagavatam, which is accepted unanimously by the great Acharyas. I'll read one more and we'll take a few reflections. In that planet of Satyaloka, there is neither bereavement nor old age nor death. There is no pain of any kind, and therefore there are no anxieties, save that sometimes due to consciousness there is a feeling of compassion for those unaware of the process of devotional service who are subjected to unsurpassable miseries in the material world. Purport, foolish men of materialistic temperament do not take advantage of successive authorized knowledge. The Vedic knowledge is authorized and is acquired not by experiment, but by authentic statements of the Vedic literatures explained by bona fide authorities. Simply by becoming an academic scholar, one cannot understand the Vedic statements. One has to approach the real authority who has received the Vedic knowledge by disciplic succession, 
as clearly explained in the Bhagavad Gita 4.2. Lord Krishna affirmed that the system of knowledge as explained in the Bhagavad Gita was explained to the sun god and the knowledge descended by disciplic succession from the sun god to his son Manu and from Manu to King Ikshvaku, the forefather of Lord Ramachandra. And thus the system of knowledge was explained down the line of great sages, one after another. But in due course of time, the authorized succession was broken, and therefore just to reestablish the true spirit of the knowledge, the Lord again explained the same knowledge to Arjuna, who, is a, who was a bona fide candidate for understanding due to his being a pure devotee of the Lord. Bhagavad Gita, as it was understood by Arjuna, is also explained in Gita 10, 12 through 13. But there are many foolish men who do not follow in the footsteps of Arjuna in understanding the spirit of Bhagavad Gita. They create instead their own interpretations, which are as foolish as they themselves, and thereby only help to put a stumbling block on the path of real understanding, misdirecting the innocent followers who are less intelligent or the shudras. It is said that one should become a brahmana before one can understand the Vedic statements. And this stricture is as important as the stricture that no one shall become a lawyer who has not qualified himself as a graduate. Such a stricture is not an impediment in the path of progress for anyone and everyone, but it is necessary for an unqualified understanding of a particular science. Vedic knowledge is misinterpreted by those who are not qualified brahmanas. A qualified brahmana is one who has undergone strict training under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master. The Vedic wisdom guides us to understand our relation with the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna and to acting accordingly in order to achieve the desired result of going, of returning home back to Godhead. But materialistic men do not understand this. They want to make a plan to become happy in a place where there is no happiness. For false happiness, they try to reach other planets, either by Vedic rituals or by spacecraft, but they should know for certain that any amount of materialistic adjustment for becoming happy in a place which is meant for distress cannot benefit the misguided man because, after all, the whole universe, with all its paraphernalia, will come to an end after a certain period. Then all plans of materialistic happiness will automatically come to an end. The intelligent person, therefore, makes a plan to return home back to Godhead. Such an intelligent person surpasses all the pangs of material existence, like birth, death, old age, and disease and old age. He is actually happy because he has no anxieties of material existence. But as a compassionate sympathizer, he feels unhappiness for the suffering, for the suffering materialistic men. He is actually happy because he has no anxieties of material existence. But as a compassionate sympathizer, he feels unhappiness for the suffering materialistic men. And thus he occasionally comes before the materialistic men to teach them the necessity of going back to Godhead. All the bona fide acharyas preach this truth of returning home back to Godhead and warn men not to make a false plan for happiness in a place where happiness is only a myth. Okay, a few reflections or questions. And if you would turn the Zoom room back on or make it manifest, it's a vyakta. A vyakta, vyakta, matsarvam. What did you all hear so far that would you like to report on that moved your soul so dramatically that now your life, you're seeing things in a different way and you're ready to take action? Yes. I like the statement that um, you'll, if uh, the senses will be totally engaged in devotional service, they will not be affected by the uh, material uh, energy. So um, just it's the way uh, to observe all the time if senses are trying to go somewhere, 
it means that they're active and they should be engaged and then try to find a way how to use them in devotional service. Like al always moni monitor what senses are <laughs> like looking, if they're looking for en uh, enjoyment. Could you understand? No. I can't. I can't understand yeah. him. It's an extra thick. Mask. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's thick. Yeah. Um, I like the point, the statement that um, uh, if uh, the senses will be totally engaged in devotional service, then they won't be affected by material energy. So it means that, um, like, if you always monitor, if the senses are trying to go somewhere to look for enjoyment, just try to bring them to devotional service, like in a certain certain way, engage them. Yeah, it's an excellent point, so important, because we're right in the midst of the material world, and the secret of devotional service that Krishna teaches in the Bhagavad Gita is that if you dedicate everything to the service of the Supreme Lord, then you won't become entangled by the laws of material nature. Otherwise, if you renounce it, it'll, you'll still be attached, and if you try to embrace it, then you become more entangled. This is an excellent point. Thank you. Yes, Roman. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Um, I just um, kind of like uh, self-realized something that uh, when we are going through Srimad Bhagavatam, so we're talking about senses. And as soon as we start talking about senses, the uh, Bhagavad Gita 15.7 came to my mind. When Mamai Vaishu Jivalaki Jiva Butak Sanadhanaha Manakshashtan Indriani Prakriti Stan Hikarsati, when Krishna tells that uh, the living entities is the conditional uh, condition it in the world but, and they are uh, mislead by their senses. And uh, Srimad Bhagavatam actually gives us this nectar where we can use our senses to, uh, to absorb what we can't experience in our material world. And I kind of like went through the, all of that that we read today. And uh, uh, it's important how we rely on our parampara to know all of this information as it is, to know the truth, and to know that we can have the such experience in the material world. And only information that we're getting it comes from the spiritual world. And that's how we can engage all of our senses to understand all of this uh, knowledge. And uh, that is like a nectar that we can drink every day in order to uh, understand what is going on here and what is going on in the material world. And, uh, and, and it's really, really uh, uh, a gift for us. That's a, such a nice point you made. And as we read these beginning sections, it seems as if uh, this kind of knowledge is not readily available anywhere else except for the Bhagavatam, especially the ways that Shukadev Goswami describes how a, a transcendentalist leaves the body and the layers of the universe, and then somebody may have some last desires to see all the planets. Take the scenic route out, please. And then there's... Uh, uh, these are... Um, Uncommon details that one normally doesn't get in any kind of s spiritual context. It's helpful. Uh, yes, Radhakri Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, uh, I, I really like the purport where Prabhupada mentioned that uh, the person is happy because he does not have any anxiety for material existence. That line is was telling that the, all the problem which we all have is because we are anxious about the existence here in the material world. And I think he also emphasized many times about uh, this is a temporary nature and this place is uh, full of misery. So I like that the part where uh, the more was, you know, all the suffering because we are more worried about material existence. If we don't have that one, then we are happy. So. Yes, I know. As I mentioned earlier, my god brother Rajendra Nanda Prabhu, who uh, has cancer and not long to stay in the body. And I was talking to him today and he was saying how that realization now about how there's nothing f for him here in the material world is especially strong. He said, he, 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 does, he looks at the world and, and feels, yeah, it's, it's really a hoax. There's, there was nothing really for me here <laughs> ever. And that's, um, 
so clear in the Bhagavatam that, that there's no cheating, there's no promise that, yes, you could be happy in the material world. Shukadev Goswami and all the teachers are very straightforward about that. Lights on. One more? Yes, Sukeshri, and then we're coming over to Priya Kishori. Hi, Krishna Prabhu. I just wanted to um, double check to make sure that Bhakti yogis don't have to um, worry about where the soul will leave from. They just focus on Krishna's name. Is that right, Prabhu? Yeah. Uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, 8th chapter, Attaining the Supreme, Krishna mentions that there are various ways in which yogis expertly pick the time and then have a methodology for leaving the body. And he says that the devotees don't worry about these because they leave it to Krishna. Whenever, whenever and wherever, that's an okay time, place. They just are worried, yes, as you said, about staying engaged in chanting Krishna's names and being engaged in devotional service. And they leave the rest up to Krishna. But uh, all the devotees also will follow the same realm, Prabhu. Like, that's the reason we actually read in fifth canto. So um, when we pass through all these beautiful planets and uh, places so we don't get attracted towards them, that we know ahead of time, we keep our focus steady on going back to Goloka Well, that that's right? why it's so important to hear the Bhagavatam, because then you've already gone everywhere. You've seen everything. You've done everything. We, you know, we have this experience when we hear the Bhagavatam that it entertains every psychological condition a human can have. And when you go through it, you go like, yeah, I've been there. <laughs> I understand it. And in a similar way, as we hear repeatedly, practically on every page of Prophet's purports, there's nothing here, nothing here to see. It's, it's a waste of time, basically. And it's all misery. So by... A devotee who's fully convicted of that will not be so interested in this in looking around the material world. They already have left it behind. However, the it's not stereotype. There, you know, there are innumerable living entities. They have all different types of situations and circumstances, and Krishna perfectly accommodates those. And so, if there is somebody like uh, we have the case of uh, Druva. Juva Maharaj had wanted something, and then after he received the benediction, he said, I really don't want it anymore. But Krishna, no, no, you take it. <laughs> you know, see what it's like. He wanted it. So, you know, just... And, and in, in the Bhagavatam 10.14.8, in the purport, uh, the commentator says that Krishna is expert at giving a devotee exactly what he or she needs to exhaust any last vestiges of desire for enjoying the material world. So there is a unique prescription for everyone in what happens in this lifetime and then how one leaves the world and so forth. Pardon? Kardama and Devahuti. Yeah. We want to say more about that? Yeah, go ahead. And then we got Priya and Anushri. Uh, well, um, Karadama Muni actually had the divine vision of Lord Vishnu. And he said, I shouldn't be asking you this, but I want a wife. Right. And Lord Vishnu said, I know that. <laughs> Why wouldn't I know that? <laughs> yeah. Um, Prabhu, this point adds a little to what Bhakta Roman Prabhu had mentioned Who? about uh, Bhakta Roman Prabhu. Yes. He mentioned about this verification of knowledge, and Srila Prabhupada says that um, a soul can either choose to um, accept the material um, knowledge of scientists or what's in Bhagavatam. Right. But we have the added benefit that the, the knowledge in the Bhagavatam has been verified but by such great intelligent souls. And I just wanted to relate to this to. Um, you know, in my work every day, uh, we conduct studies upon studies to look at, you know, user data. And one of the biggest parts is to look at what is the most unbiased source, what, what is our source of truth. Oh. And then we spend millions of dollars every day. And then we conduct cross studies to verify if that source of truth is right. And even then, there's always this percentage that you can never omit of error. 
And um, I, I really appreciate that um, Srimad Bhagavatam is that source through which you can never go wrong. And historically, you can never go wrong. So um, I just, um, you know, it helps me realize on a practical level that no matter how much we apply our own intelligence, there's always going to be a margin of error. Yeah, nice point. Thank you. I especially, my ear caught that point about bias. Because there's a way that if something's motivated, then you think, you know, there's a study that if you write things by hand with a pen, that you imbibe more of it. And then you find out the big pen company paid for the study. And it's like, well, I'm not <laughs> sure about that. <laughs> okay, Anushri. Um, I wanted to say two things. I liked when it said... Uh, in everything, the devotee sees Krishna, and he sees everything in Krishna. And I was just relating it to the point yesterday in the purport. I think it was saying that all that we can conceive are but different parts of the Lord's form. And I was thinking we're like fortunate to know about the personal form of the Lord, because impersonalists just have a nondescript form, so they can just focus on anything that they think of. And the second thing is, I liked where it said, don't make a false plan for happiness where happiness is only a myth. Right. And I liked how it said false plan because you can still make it, mm. but make like the right one. <laughs> nice points. Yeah. And, and going through this, uh, these first sections in the uh, second canto of the Bhagavatam that, and this whole idea of seeing the Lord in the powers of material nature and then as the universal form and then as Paramatma and then as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, Kishore. And then Prabhupada mentioned how by seeing the deity, that's a better way of trying to see the universal form. And we come really quickly in this reading to understanding the personal form of the Lord. I mean, within a couple hours, somebody reads this and then they go through that whole progression coming up to the perfection of it. And then it's practically available through coming to a temple, you see the deity and so forth. I also appreciated that there's a way that Prabhupada says that the faith has to be well-reasoned, that when one hears about and understands it, just as somebody who's untrained in a science, they won't know what they're looking at until they get trained. So the Bhagavatam gives us that clear vision so we can understand exactly what we're looking at when we see the universe, where the energies are coming from. Nice points. Okay, last two. Thank you, Maharaj, for a wonderful class. Um, I was reflecting on the point where they said that when I was, when you were reading about this whole life fair, and I found that it was so complicated, and it's beyond my imagination even to control those kind of airs and let it out. And then it said that uh, no amount of Vedic scholarship will actually lead you to to the supreme. And uh, that made me feel that, you know, just a simple heart. And then it also, the purport also mentioned that just approach a bona fide spiritual master and how much Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has made it easy for us in this age, just chant the Maha Mantra and approach the spiritual master and you will achieve the desired goal. So that gave me so much hope when I heard that today. Yeah, I was thinking last night because there, I was in one of the Zoom rooms with some of the new people who are very new to Bhakti. And I was just noticing that they're very simple and open-hearted. Because the comments they were giving, like, yeah, I just want to come here and <laughs> learn this. It's so. <laughs> and I was thinking that if somebody's open to hearing and they have a simple heart, they can surpass all the sophisticated people in the world who think they know this and know that. As you're saying, it's, it's very much available to those who are just sincere. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, thank you, Shula Gurudev, for these uh, amazing, beautiful readings. Uh, I have one question. So how uh, can one uh, not have any uh, uh, material vestiges of, en you know, enjoyment? And uh, sometimes, um, so you don't, you know, um, so one doesn't have to get it and go through it and everything for at first only you know not having any material vestiges how to remove that and sometimes you know mind also tricks um, that uh, oh this we are asking for service or something so you know can you please help well when we approach krishna he's like fire and he purifies us 
And so to be associated with the supreme pure, we also have to be pure ourselves. And the way we get close to Krishna is by chanting his names and doing service. And that way we can, we can utilize all the desires we have now in his service, whatever ambitions we have, we transfer them to service and we go on chanting the holy name. And Lord Chaitanya has said, Chaito Dharpana Marjanam, that the, the heart gets cleansed by the process, it actually works. And so by the Bhagavat process and the Pancharatrik process together, the senses get purified. Sarvo padi vanir muktam tapratvena nirmalam rishikena rishikesha sevanam bhakti ruchite. There's a way in which when you engage your senses in Krishna's service, then they become purified because you're dealing with the supreme pure. Just like you start doing deity worship. And when you approach the deity, the environment is so purifying because Krishna's there. And when you leave that environment, you'll notice that the material world seems grosser than it was when you walked in because your senses are getting purified. And when you chant Hare Krishna, you also notice that your heart's getting cleansed because you don't desire the same kinds of things you did before. Your values change. I, I had a, um, this kind of uh, revelation one day when I was in Los Angeles and we had been working on Watsaka for a few days to help get ready for Rathiatra. And you know how it is when you're on the Watsaka Avenue. You're just around devotees all day because you go from your apartment into the Mangalarti and then go to the kitchen. And unless you're going out on Sankirtan or driving somewhere to the store, you're basically surrounded by devotees. It's like being in Sri Rangam. And so I was there for a few days and then it was time to go to the Rathiatra. And I remember actually even driving to the, going to the Rathiatra, it was with devotees in the Rathiatra parade, then at the festival site, but then walking across, oh, walking across the, the um, Venice, well, the strip, I realized, wow, the material world is really going on. And I noticed, that I was thinking, why aren't these people chanting? You know? <laughs> and they had all kinds of music going on and uh, the, the gross nature of their um, endeavors was apparent. It's such a stark contrast. And I think as we do devotional service in association with devotees, we'll start to notice more and more the contrast. And a whole lifetime of this kind of practice puts one in a situation where we can point all our desires towards going back to God, especially we're hearing these this information about what it's what it, what happens at the time of death. I mean, I can just say talking to Rajendra Nandana Prabhu, just in in that very intense situation where you realize I only have a little bit of time left in this body, which is pretty much true for all of us. But when you actually are uh, given the notice for it, then you're context is a little different the way you're expressing things and you know I can tell just in talking to him what's coming out gratitude that I got a chance to serve and looking forward to just really putting all his focus into leaving the world so it actually happens for devotees in ISKCON in this world they would follow this simple process and so it'll happen happen for you too Om Tat Sat And we're continuing with everyone's permission. Everyone okay? Yes. Sure? Yes. Okay. Text 28. After reaching Satyaloka, the devotee is specifically able to be incorporated fearlessly by the subtle body in an identity similar to that of the gross body. And one after another, he gradually attains stages of existence from earthly to watery, fiery, glowing and airy until he reaches the ethereal stage. 
Anyone can reach Brahma Loka or Satya Loka by dint of spiritual perfection and practice is qualified. Anyone who can reach Brahma Loka or Satya Loka by dint of spiritual perfection and practice is qualified to attain three different types of perfection. One who has attained a specific planet by dint of pious activities attains places in terms of his comparative pious activities. One who has attained the place by dint of virat or hiranyagarbha worship is liberated along with the liberation of Brahma. But one who attains the place by dint of devotional service is specifically mentioned here in relation to how he can penetrate into the different coverings of the universe and thus ultimately disclose his spiritual identity in the absolute atmosphere of supreme existence. According to Srila Jiva Goswami, all the universes are clustered together up and down, and each and every one of them is separately sevenfold covered. The watery portion is beyond the sevenfold coverings, and each covering is ten times more expansive than the previous covering. The personality of Godhead who creates all such universes by his breathing period lies above the cluster of the universes. The water of the causal ocean is differently situated than the covering water of the universe. The water that serves as covering for the universe is material, whereas the water of the causal ocean is spiritual. As such, the watery covering mentioned herein is considered to be the false egoistic covering of all living entities. And the gradual process of liberation from the material coverings, one after another, as mentioned herein, is the gradual process of being liberated from false egoistic conceptions of the material gross body. And then being absorbed in the identification of the subtle body till the attainment of the pure spiritual body in the absolute realm of the kingdom of God. Did you all get all that? Really? Okay. The water that serves as covering for the universe is material, whereas the water of the causal ocean is spiritual. As such, the watery covering mentioned herein is considered to be the false egoistic covering of all living entities. And the gradual process of liberation from the material coverings, one after another, as mentioned herein, is the gradual process of being liberated from false egoistic conceptions of the material gross body and then being absorbed in the identification of the subtle body till the attainment of the pure spiritual body in the absolute realm of the kingdom of God. Srila Sridhar Swami confirms that a part of the material nature after being initiated by the Lord is known as Mahat Tattva. A fractional portion of the Mahat Tattva is called the false ego. A portion of the ego is the vibration of sound, and a portion of sound is atmospheric air. A portion of the airy atmosphere is turned into forms, and the forms constitute the power of electricity or heat. Heat produces the smell of the aroma of the earth, and the gross earth is produced by such aroma. And all these combined together constitute the cosmic phenomenon. The extent of the cosmic phenomenon is calculated to be diametrically, both ways, four billion miles. Then the coverings of the universe begin. The first stratum of the covering is calculated to extend 80 million miles, and the subsequent coverings of the universe are respectively of fire, effulgence, air, and ether, one after another, each extending 10 times further than the previous. The fearless devotee of the Lord penetrates each one of them and ultimately reaches the absolute atmosphere where everything is of one and the same spiritual identity. Then the devotee enters one of the Vaikuntha planets where he assumes exactly the same form as the Lord and engages in the loving transcendental service of the Lord. That is the highest perfection of devotional life. Beyond this, there is nothing to be desired or achieved by the perfect yogi. The devotee thus surpasses the subtle objects of different senses, like aroma by smelling, the palate by tasting, vision by seeing forms, touch by contact, contact, contacting, 
the vibrations of the ear by ethereal identification and the sense organs by material activities. Beyond the sky, there are subtle coverings resembling the elementary coverings of the universes. The gross coverings are a development of partial ingredients of the subtle causes. So the yogi or devotee, along with liquidation of the gross elements, relinquishes the subtle causes like aroma by smelling. The pure spiritual spark, the living entity, thus becomes completely cleansed of all material contamination to become eligible for entrance into the kingdom of God. By non-application of the conglomerating process. There's one substance to begin with. The universe is manifest from one substance and by a kind of coagulation, uh, there appear varieties one after another. An example that we can use is milk. It's one substance. However, if you, through a chemical process, like adding some buttermilk or some some kind of acid, acidic substance. What do you all use? Lemon. lemon. Put lemon. Anything else? Huh? Vinegar. vinegar. I did not know that. So <laughs> vinegar. Then it can, it it will change into another form. It'll become uh, curds, and then from there you can churn it a little more, and it'll. What do you get out of that? Well, I mean, cheese, whatever everyone calls cheese. Then you get butter. You can get from milk. You can get many different substances, yogurt, and then butter, then ghee. Expands different ways. It's one substance. So the, the one substance of the universe, then through the ingredient of the Lord's glance, the modes of nature, and the time factor, then that one substance becomes divided into many different varieties. And that's what we're seeing around us. But then at the end, through the non-conglomerating non process, then it uh, folds back into itself and becomes one substance. So the point here is this mind, whatever we have here comes from the Mahatattva. Here I'm pointing to the physical body. So we have the gross and subtle body. These are all uh, made from that original Mahatattva. So the yogi knows the process, the non-conglomerating process through which he or she uh, merges the elements back from gross into the subtle until the uh, subtle elements are um, no longer there and just the living being is, ex exists. Muktva hitva yata rupam swarupena vyavastiti the Bhagavatam describes liberation means the giving up of all these subtle coverings, subtle and gross coverings of the living entity and coming into the position of the spiritual soul without identification with matter at all. May I continue? The devotee thus surpasses. Did I read that? I didn't. It starts the same way, though. Devotee, comma. Yeah, so we're on 30. It's funny because they both start with... The, 29 says the devotee thus surpasses, and the next one says the devotee, comma, thus surpassing. That's where we are now. <laughs> Except no substitute. We're on 30. The devotee, thus surpassing the gross and subtle forms of coverings, enters the plane of egoism. And in that state, he merges the material modes of nature, ignorance, and passion in this point of neutralization and thus reaches egoism in goodness. After this, all egoism is merged in the Mahatattva, and he comes to the point of pure self-realization. Ready? Okay, it's a long purport. So just see if you can hear without any distraction through the whole purport. Pure self-realization, as we have several times discussed, is the pure consciousness of admitting oneself 
to be the eternal servitor of the Lord. Thus, one is reinstated in his original position of transcendental loving service to the Lord, as will be clearly explained in the following verse. This stage of rendering transcendental loving service to the Lord without any hopes of emolument from the Lord or any other way can be attained when the material senses are purified and the original pure state of the senses is revived. It is suggested herein that the process of purifying the senses is by the yogic way, namely the gross senses are merged in the mode of ignorance and the subtle senses are merged in the mode of passion. The mind belongs to the mode of goodness and therefore is called deva maya or godly. Perfect purification of the mind is made possible when one is fixed in the conviction of being the eternal servitor of the Lord. Therefore, simple attainment of goodness is also a material mode. One has to surpass this stage of material goodness and reach the point of purified goodness, or Vasudev Sattva. This Vasudev Sattva helps one to enter into the kingdom of God. We may also remember in this connection that the process of gradual emancipation by the devotee in the manner mentioned above, although authoritative, is not viable in the present age because of people's being primarily unaware of yoga practice. The so-called yoga practice by the professional protagonist may be physiologically beneficial but such small successes cannot help one in the attainment of spiritual emancipation as mentioned herein. 5,000 years ago, when the social status of human society was in perfect Vedic order, the yoga process mentioned herein was a common affair for everyone because everyone, and especially the Brahmanas and Kshatriyas, was trained in the transcendental art under the care of the spiritual master far away from home in the status of brahmacharya. Modern man, however, is incompetent to understand it perfectly. Lord Sri Chaitanya therefore made it easier for the prospective devotee of the present age in the following manner. Ultimately, there is no difference in the result. The first and foremost point is that one must understand the prime importance of bhakti yoga. What is the first and foremost point? Correct. The living beings in different species of life are undergoing different terms of engagement according to their fruit of actions and reactions. But in the execution of different activities, one who secures some resources in bhakti yoga can understand the importance of service to the Lord through the causeless mercy of the Lord, as well as that of the spiritual master. A sincere soul is helped by the Lord through meeting a bona fide spiritual master the representative of the Lord. By the instruction of such a spiritual master, one gets the seed of bhakti yoga. Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu recommends that the devotee sow the seed of bhakti yoga in his heart and nurture it by watering, by the watering of hearing and chanting the holy name, fame, etc. of the Lord. The simple process of offenselessly chanting and hearing the holy name of the Lord will gradually promote one very soon to the stage of emancipation. There are three stages in chanting the holy name of the Lord. The first stage is the offensive chanting of the holy name, and the second is the reflective stage of chanting the holy name. The third stage is the offenseless chanting of the holy name of the Lord. In the second stage only, the stage of reflection between the offensive and offenseless stages, one automatically attains the stage of emanc emancipation. And in the offenseless stage, one actually enters into the kingdom of God, although physically he may apparently be within the material world. To attain the offenseless stage, one must be on guard in the following manner. When we speak of hearing and chanting, it means that not only should one chant and hear of the holy name of the Lord as Rama, Krishna, or systematically the 16 names, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, 
But one should also read and hear the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam in the association of devotees. Check. The primary practice of bhakti yoga will cause the seed already sowed in heart to sprout. And by regular watering process, a regularly and by a regular watering process, as mentioned above, the bhakti yoga creeper will begin to grow. By systematic nurturing, the creeper will grow to such an extent that it will penetrate the coverings of the universe. As we have heard in the previous verses, reach the effulgent sky, the Brahma Jyoti, and go farther and farther and reach the spiritual sky. Where there, are new, where there are innumerable spiritual planets called Vaikuntha Lokas. Above all of them is Krishna Loka or Goloka Vrindavan, wherein the growing creeper enters and takes repose at the lotus feet of Lord Sri Krishna, the original personality of Godhead. When one reaches the lotus feet of Lord Krishna on Goloka Vrindavan, the watering process of hearing and reading as also, as also chanting of the holy name in the pure devotional stage fructifies and the fruit grown there in the form of love of God, fruits grown there in the form of love of God are tangibly tasted by the devotee, even though he is here in, the, in this material world. The ripe fruits of love of God are relished only by the devotees constantly engaged in the watering process as described above. I'll read that last sentence again. It might be helpful. The ripe fruits of love of God are relished only by the devotees constantly engaged in the watering process as described above. By the working devotee, but the working devotee must always be mindful so that the creeper which has so grown will not be cut off. Therefore, he should be mindful of the following considerations. One, offense by one at the feet of a pure devotee may be likened to the mad elephant who devastates a very good garden if it enters. Two, one must be careful to guard himself against such offenses at the feet of pure devotees, just as one protects a creeper by all-around fencing. Three, it so happens that by the watering process, some weeds are also grown, and unless such weeds are uprooted, the nurturing of the main creeper or the creeper of bhakti yoga may be hampered. Four, actually these weeds are material enjoyment, merging of the self in the absolute without separate individuality and many other desires in the field of religion, economic development, sense enjoyment, and emancipation. There are many other weeds like disobedience to the tenets tenets of these revealed scriptures, unnecessary engagements, killing animals, and hankering after mutual gain, prestige, and adoration. Six, if sufficient care is not taken, then the watering process may only help to breed the weeds, stunting the healthy growth of the main creeper and resulting in no fructification of the ultimate requirement, love of God. Seven, the devotee must therefore be very careful to uproot the different weeds in the very beginning. Only then will the healthy growth of the main creeper not be stunted. Eight, and by so doing, the devotee is able to relish the fruit of love of God and thus pra live practically with Lord Krishna, even in this life, and be able to see the Lord in every step. The highest perfection of life is to enjoy life constantly in the association of the Lord, and one who can relish this does not aspire after any temporary enjoyment of the material world via any, via other media. Haribo. <laughs> uh, it's easy to forget how much nectar is in are, is in these books until you just really go ahead and read them, right? And then you feel like you're swimming in an ocean. Don't you? It's quite amazing. I mean, even one purport you could live off for the rest of your life. 
if you're stranded on a desert island. You just take it and apply every line and you, you would be successful with the speak of the unlimited purports that were given here. Yes. Thank you for reading this. It was so wonderful. I just have a, a while you were reading this whole, um, each layer is 10 times uh, thicker than the other, the, when we give up the gross body and then the subtle body, the mind, intelligence, ego. And I was remembering um, Gopakumar's story where he crosses all these layers and then he reaches the material planets and then he reaches the Vaikuntha planets. And at each level he was, you know, he, he would have just stayed there because at one point he was even asked like, why don't you just stay here for some more time? Like now Mahakal Puravashi, he was asked, but he, because he had, he was so strong in his faith and his mantra and the Madan Gopal, which he never gave up in spite of getting all these experiences. Um, even like when he went to the Dwarka Vaikuntha, I, I was remembering that he was told that, why don't you change your dress like ours? Because they are so merciful, they can't see him in the coward boy dress. Uh, but the bottom line of this whole story was that in the end, he was advised to go back to Vrindavan, go back to the earthly planet and uh, develop that love for God because this is the only place where we can. So I was thinking like the process is so simple, it's just in front of us, but we just like, we are so much engrossed in gathering knowledge, but not realizing that it's just like, it's like the deer musk, it's just around us. Krishna is around us wherever we talk his name there where that's where Braja manifests so I was just realizing that all this knowledge is good but if you're not chanting if you're not believing in what you're doing then this is all like of no use you can just get carried away at every point while you're traveling back back home back to Godhead right yeah very true nice one two one two Ty goes to the runner um, Prabhu, I, I, um, I really like this specific purport that we read last because um, we were reading about, you know, the various different planetary systems, how the yogis leave the body. It all sounded so complicated until Srila Prabhupada said that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gives us a very simple way um, to go back to Godhead. Um, my question is around um, when Srila Prabhupada talks about these weeds and when we offer the, when we water the plant of bhakti, automatically these weeds are watered. Um, what is, if um, our true original nature is to uh, be a servant of the Lord, um, where do these weeds, uh, the seeds of these weeds come from? And um, is it because of the, our fault that they get watered or are they naturally watered? Yeah, let me see that notebook. It's in here. The answer to your question came yesterday. And I'm only looking it up now. So let's see. The sins are born of forgetfulness. All sins are born of forgetfulness. So, thank you, sorry. All sins are born of forgetfulness. So, uh, what is ignorance? It's ignorance. Uh, the original problem is ignoring Krishna. Who's, uh, if we ignore Krishna, then we have to ignore ourselves also because we're part and parcel of Krishna. Then we get a false uh, existence because then you don't know yourself. You get accommodated with a, a whole false set of circumstances. And the point here that Prabhupada made, we extracted that from his purport, is it's from that ignorance of Krishna that all the seeds of material existence arise. And then uh, we have to contend with them because seeds grow as we continue to water them. And, and unless there's an intervention that mentioned in the next part of the book, Mayana Kulina Nabaspiteri Tam, what is it? Oh, no, I'm going to a different verse. I'm sorry. Bhayam dvitiya bini besha tasyad ishat ape tasya vipariyo smriti tanmaya tan buddha abhijitam bhaktyaika yesham guru devatatma. So, what's the solution? One has to turn one's attention back to Krishna. And then it's in that process that those 
seeds like barley corns that are cooked by the sun and then by, f by fire, they won't sprout anymore. Barley corn, do you know that? If you cook it in the sun and then in fire, then it, it no longer can germinate. So similarly, that's in our Bhaktivedanta test. <laughs> that's why Srivas Prabhu is appreciating. <laughs> so then, then they all become burned up. If They're born out of ignorance. I could have just said that. Okay. Yeah. You cannot plant the popcorns. That's right. It won't grow. Um, so I really liked, like, also, like, Priya, I liked the last sentence of the last purport, which says that we can enjoy life with the association of the Lord. And um, in general, while reading this chapter, um, it talked a lot about how there is no happiness to be found in the material world. And a lot of times that can seem a little overwhelming for me. But the phrase that we can enjoy life in the association of the Lord shows that we can still like share our joys with Krishna because he's the one giving facility for everything we do. Like, for example, we can still enjoy food, but appreciate that Krishna is the one giving us the plants and the vegetables and like offer it to him. Or even like going outside, we can admire Krishna's beauty. And it's all about the mindset in which you interact with the material world. Yeah, it's an important point that you make because if I'm told that there's no happiness in the material world and there's no enjoyment here, I'll say, uh, then where, how do I fulfill my sense that I want to enjoy? And unless I'm giving something, given something superior, then the default mode will be, I'll come back to the material world and try, try again. Because if, if, if at once you don't succeed, try, try again. So that's what the living, the conditioned soul does. But Krishna consciousness is a constant festival. As you know, it's, Prabhupada said, uh, the association is simply wonderful. The philosophy is simply wonderful. The deities are simply wonderful. Everything's simply wonderful about Krishna consciousness. And so there's no question of not enjoying. And uh, unless we have that, and we're able to enjoy. One of my godbrothers, Dayananda Prabhu, is, um, a, 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 does a lot of outreach. And one of, the, one of his presentations, actually his main presentation, he has two points. He said, you should enjoy through uh, Leela and, and the holy names. So if you're able to enjoy hearing about Krishna's pastimes and also chanting the holy name, the association of devotees, then you can easily give up the paltry happiness in the material world. You won't miss anything. Nothing to see here. Thank you for all the comments, everyone. And very nice recount of Gopal Kumar. Especially important about him being enticed at every level of the coverings of the universe. So we have to be uh, stalwarts in wanting to go back home, back to Godhead, because somebody will whisper in our ear, why don't you just stay a little longer? And Prahlad Maharaj says in his prayers that I'm afraid of that. I, I'm not afraid of you, Lord Nishingadev, but I am afraid of your Vishnu Maya, because it's, it's so enchanting that you can get attached to it and then be pulled back down again into the machine of the material energy and forget. Yes? Please. Maharaj, uh, about the mad elephant offense, um, we do so much sadhana and services, but we still end up doing, at least I end up doing mad elephant offense. I do talks with some devotees and then I feel bad about why I did the way I did. Um, I, all, I was hearing another class where Prabhu said that um, you can tell things to somebody who you are friendly with or close with if you are giving some inputs or guidance or advice, but don't do that uh, if you're not close enough um, uh, to a person. So I was, my question is like, how do you approach situations like that where you feel something is not correct, but you're not really close to the person or even friendly at the same time, you don't want to escalate things. How, how do you avoid, how do, how should I avoid that 
mad elephant offense by saying anything. Unless you're in a position, a signed position, or someone has signed up under you to take advice, then you could take it to somebody else who does have that duty, if it's a genuine complaint, and ask them to help rectify it. Other than that, it doesn't do much good anyway, because free advice is not so much appreciated in this world. Prabhupada mentions this in the 17th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita under the austerities of speech, and he says that we shouldn't give advice to people unless they signed up for it. They're disciple-type people. And then, even then, you should be really careful. But there is a way in which you can delegate it to somebody who does have that duty to do. And it's a, it's a safer way to do it. May I read one more purport? And then we'll have the Dhammarashtakam. Only the purified soul can attain the perfection of associating with the personality of Godhead in complete bliss and satisfaction in his constitutional state. Whoever is able to renovate such devotional perfection is never again attracted by this material world and he never returns. Purport, we should, specific, we should specially note in this verse the description of Gatim Bhagavatim to become merged in the rays of the Parabrahman, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, as desired by the Brahmavadi impersonalist, is not Bhagavatam perfection. The Bhagavatas never accept merging in the impersonal rays of the Lord, but always aspire after personal association with the Supreme Lord in one of the Vaikuntha spiritual planets in the spiritual sky. The whole of the spiritual sky, of which the total number of the material skies is only an insignificant part, is full of unlimited numbers of Vaikuntha planets. The destination of the devotee, the Bhagavata, is to enter into one of the Vaikuntha planets, in each of which the Personality of Godhead, in his unlimited personal expansions, enjoys himself in the association of unlimited numbers of pure devotee associates. The conditioned souls in the material world after gaining emancipation by devotional service are promoted to these planets. But the number of ever liberated souls is, by, is far, far greater than the number of conditioned souls in the material world. And the ever liberated souls in the Vaikuntha planets never care to visit this mater miserable material world. The impersonalists who aspire to merge in the impersonal Brahmajyoti effulgence of the Supreme Lord, but have no conception of loving devotional service to him in his personal form in the spiritual manifestation may be compared to certain species of fish who, being born in the rivers and rivulets, migrate to the great ocean. Could you put that in the book? They cannot stay in the ocean indefinitely for their urge for sense gratification brings them back to the rivers and streams to spawn. Similarly, when the materialist becomes frustrated in his attempts to enjoy himself in the limited material world, he may seek impersonal liberation by merging. This is kind of what we were just talking about a second ago because of Avantika's point. Similarly, when the materialist becomes frustrated in his attempts to enjoy himself in the limited material world, he may seek impersonal liberation by merging either with the causal ocean or with the impersonal Brahmajyoti effulgence. However, as neither the causal ocean nor the impersonal Brahmajyoti effulgence affords any superior substitute for association and engagement of the senses, the impersonalist will fall again into the limited material world to become entangled once more in the wheel of births and deaths, drawn on by the inextinguishable desire for sensual enjoyment. But any devotee who enters the kingdom of God by transcendental engagement of his senses in devotional service and who associates with the liberated souls and the personality of Godhead there will never be attracted to the limited surroundings of the material world. In the Bhagavad Gita 8.15, also the same is confirmed. As the Lord says, the great Mahatmas or the Bhakti Yogis, after attaining my association, 
never come back to this material world, which is full of miseries and is non-permanent. The highest perfection of life, therefore, is to attain his association and nothing else. The Bhakti Yogi, being completely engaged in the Lord's service, has no attraction for any other process of liberation like jnana or yoga. A pure devotee is 100 percent. A pure devotee is a 100 percent devotee of the Lord and nothing more. We should further note in this verse that the two words shantam and anandam, which denote that devotional service of the Lord can really bestow upon the devotee two important benedictions, namely peace and satisfaction. The impersonalist is desirous of becoming one with the Supreme, or in other words, he wants to become the Supreme. This is a myth only. The mystic yogis become encumbered by various mystic powers and so have neither peace nor satisfaction. So neither the impersonalist nor the yogi can have real peace and satisfaction. But the devotee can become fully peaceful and satisfied because of his association with the complete whole. Therefore, merging in the absolute or attaining some mystic powers has no attraction for the devotee. Attainment of love of Godhead means complete freedom from all other attractions. Could you please write that one down? Attainment of love of Godhead means complete freedom from all other attractions. Do you, do you like that one? The conditioned soul has many aspirations, such as becoming a religious man, a rich man, or a first-class enjoyer, or becoming God himself, or becoming powerful like the mystics and acting wonderfully by getting anything or doing anything. But all these aspirations should be rejected by the prospective devotee who actually wants to revive his dormant love of God. The impure devotee aspires after all, the impure devotee aspires after all of the above mentioned material things by perfection of devotion. But a pure devotee has none of the tinges of the above contaminations, which are the influence of material desires, impersonal speculations and attainment of mystic powers. One can attain the stage of love of God by pure devotional service or by a learned labor of love for the sake of the devotee's lovable object, the personality of Godhead. To be made more clear, if one wants to attain the stage of love of Godhead, he must give up all desires for material enjoyment, he should refrain from worshiping any of the demigods, and he should devote himself only to the worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He must give up the foolish idea of becoming one with the Lord and the desire to have some wonderful powers just to get the ephemeral adoration of the, of the world. The pure devotee is only favorably engaged in the service of the Lord without any hope of emolument. Could you look up emolument, please? This will bring about love of Godhead or the stage of shantam or anandam as stated in this verse. We don't want any emolument, which means... Do you all know what emolument means? Because you get emolument from the company. Emolument, noun, a salary, fee, or profit from employment or office. Uh huh. <laughs> and where does it come from? It comes from Latin and late Middle English. Ex, which means out or thoroughly. In Latin, molere, which means grind. Means and what? Grind. Grind. Like grinding grains or something? <laughs> huh? Like then, the grind? <laughs> oh. Grinding. Oh. <laughs> Latin, emolumentum, payment to a miller for grinding corn. Oh, emolument. Say that last sentence again. Payment to a miller for grinding corn. Payment to a miller for grinding corn. You grind corn, you get something in return for it. Emolument. Why is it the for hard work is to, grind? to grind, yeah. <laughs> it goes well, right? Could you write that one down? Emolument. Okay. How did you feel about the reading? 
It's good, right? It's a, it's a simple process. If you organize the space and just read Prabhupada's books, then you'll be happy. <laughs>